This is Glendalough, in the heart of the Wicklow Mountains, just 30 miles from Ireland's capital city, Dublin. Between half and three quarters of a million people come here every year. They come from all over Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan and points between. From May to October, the ruins of this once important monastic settlement echo the constant click of cameras. The woods absorb a dozen different languages. What attracts them? Glendalough is a place of outstanding beauty. It is a place where the light changes from hour to hour, and every angle presents new splendour. But Glendalough is much more than this. Glendalough is a monument to early Irish civilization. It combines the ascetic and artistic qualities which enrich life. It embodies the spiritual motivation and practical skills which produced buildings that, even if ruinous, still stand a thousand years after they were built. Glendalough is a place apart. And its story begins with a young man called Kevin. Nobody knows exactly when or where St. Kevin was born, only that he died around 620 AD at the ripe old age of 120. Such fantastic longevity was often accorded people whose blameless lives had earned them the accolade of saint. If we assume that he lived to be 70 or even 80, that would put his birth sometime before the middle of the 6th century. He was given the Gaelic name Creevy, meaning the beautifully born one. As a young boy, he was baptised by St. Cronin and received his early education from a religious hermit named Petricus. This religious influence was continued and strengthened under the spiritual care of three monks, Dagan, Lochan and Enna, and he was later ordained a priest by Bishop Lugget. He spent some time in the monastery at Clonduch, but felt that his spiritual growth could best be served by visiting and learning from other monastic groups and individual ascetics, and he is known to have attended the funeral of one of Ireland's best-known saints, St. Kieran of Clonmacnoise. While still a young man, he came to Glaundaloch, the glen of the two lakes, in his search for a place of quiet contemplation. St. Kevin lived here, on the southern slope of the upper lake. This is what remains of the beehive hut in which he lived. Within a relatively short time of his coming here, the solitude which Kevin sought was broken by the arrival of other young men, who were also intent on the contemplative life, thereby forming a community from which the monastic city sprang. The monastery grew in size and established a reputation as a centre for learning, but it also attracted the attention of those more interested in plunder than in prayer and study. The city was attacked on several occasions by local warlords and was burned in 775 AD. Indigenous enemies were bad enough, but worse was to come. In the dying years of the 8th century, strange dragon-like ships appeared on the Irish Sea. The Vikings had arrived. Over the following century, these Scandinavian warriors established coastal settlements at Arklow and Wicklow, from which they made increasingly deep and frequent forays into the rich hinterland. Churches were favourite targets and the monastery at Glendalough was sacked by them in 834. The Vikings held sway for some 200 years, establishing Dublin in particular as a major centre for European trade and commerce. 
the Scandinavians integrated with the indigenous population, and the new order settled into a relatively peaceful, if at times strained, accommodation. In the 12th century came a new conqueror, the Normans. Their style of colonization was subjugation, not integration. Highly efficient administrators, they quickly reorganized their new conquest. In that reorganization, the ecclesiastical power base at Glendalough lost out to the emergent diocese of Dublin. This shift of power is best illustrated in the career of St. Lawrence O'Toole. Born about 1128 AD, Lawrence O'Toole was still a young boy when he was sent to Glendalough to be educated by the monks. He was won over to the spiritual life and on completion of his studies joined the community. Like St. Kevin, six centuries earlier, he was a remarkable young man whose talents were quickly recognised, becoming abbot at 25. His fame spread. When Dublin became an archbishopric in 1162, he was appointed its first archbishop. It was he who treated with Richard de Clare, the Norman knight known as Strongbow, who led the Norman attack on the city in 1170. It was also he who later acted as intermediary between the English King Henry II and the Irish nobility. On one such ambassadorial mission, he travelled to France in pursuit of an audience with Henry, but before the meeting could be arranged, Lawrence O'Toole died at Eau. The date was November 14, 1180. In 1226, Lawrence O'Toole became Saint Lawrence O'Toole, Ireland's first authenticated saint. Glendalough's glory had already faded by the time of the general suppression of monasteries in the 1530s, when it became a victim of Henry VIII's marital problems. The Gaelic name for this beautiful spot is Glown da Loch, the Glen of Two Lakes. This has been corrupted by time and anglicisation to Glendalough, but old maps often referred to the seven churches. As visitors approached Glendalough from the village of Lara, the first of these seven small stone churches is encountered here on the left side of the road. This is Trinity Church, and because it is reached before the main entrance to the ruins of the monastic settlement, it is often overlooked. We have no idea how long it has been ruinous. But as the roof here no longer exists, the materials used were obviously more perishable, either thatch or timber. It is unusual in that it has two doorways, one in the west wall and one facing south. Here is evidence that a round tower once stood near Trinity Church. It can be seen in this print in the early years of the 19th century. On our way to the main cluster of ruins, we pass through the ancient gate of Glendalough. Here, just inside the entrance, is a very early form of what was to become the Celtic cross design. Many visitors to Glendalough are surprised that this is still a parish cemetery and burials still take place. History lives in every stone here, but it is, and always has been first and foremost, a religious site. The Church of Saints Peter and Paul is one of the largest structures in the complex. This was the cathedral of the Bishop of Glendalough, but it has been enlarged and modified, repaired and renovated so many times over the centuries that it is an amalgam of different styles from different years. The other large building is the distinctive round hub. Round towers can be found in various parts of Ireland, but this one, at Clendalough, is one of the most impressive. It is certainly one of the best preserved, as well as being one of the oldest. It has withstood the rigours of a thousand years with remarkable fortitude. 
Nevertheless, by the 19th century, the conical roof which topped it had collapsed. Towards the end of the century, the Board of Works carried out the necessary repairs and restoration. When in use, the tower was divided into several floors. The floorboards and beams which supported them have long since rotted. tower is now a hollow tube. Archaeologists and historians are unsure as to what uses such towers were put. The fact that the door is 12 feet from the ground would suggest a place of refuge in times of attack. Access would begin by a ladder, which was then pulled up after the last refugee was safely inside. It could also have been a bell tower, either to sound the alarm or to call the faithful to prayer. Its relative security might also have made it suitable for the monk's library and scriptorium. Perhaps the most architecturally pleasing structure, and certainly a favourite with visitors, is St. Kevin's Church better known locally as Kevin's Kitchen. The roof is flat stone corbelling, making it impervious to fire and storm. This was a highly skilled method of roofing and can be found in Irish buildings as early as 4,000 years ago. But it is the whimsical bell tower, almost a miniature of the round tower, that gives this church its particular charm. As with all buildings in Glendalough, there have been changes in its structure. Evidence of part of the building now long demolished can be seen in the gable. Over the doorway of the priest's house are carved three figures, but they are too badly eroded to allow for interpretation. Should you hit your head on the low lintel, local lore tells us that the resultant headache can be cured by entering the ruin and turning three full circles. Just beyond the main compound of the monastic city, across a field from the graveyard, is the ruins of St. Mary's, or Lady's Church. It dates from about the 12th century. Much more impressive is St. Saviour's Church. This fine structure was founded by Bishop, later St. Lawrence O'Toole, in the first half of the 12th century. Once again, several different artistic styles can be found side by side. other emblems are less mainstream and might have been influenced by both early Celtic Christian designs as well as newer influences from continental Europe. After the dissolution of the monasteries in the 16th century, St. Saviour's, like the rest of Glendalough's churches, slowly fell into disrepair. Towards the end of the 18th century, some of the building material was removed to build other structures, such as nearby Derrybourne Bridge. Secluded near the shore of the upper lake is Reefert Church. Reefert has its own graveyard, and according to tradition, it was here that the local chieftains of the O'Tools were buried. Reefert is probably a corruption of the Gaelic Reefert, meaning the King's Cemetery. Further on lie the ruins of Chompel Neskelik. The ruins of this church can still be seen from the north side of the lake. June the 3rd is the feast day of St. Kevin, and from medieval times or even before, 
large crowds gathered here in pilgrimage, taking part in holy well ceremonies and rituals, such as making the Stations of the Cross, a reenactment of Christ's journey from Pilate's washing his hands to the resurrection from the tomb three days later. Each of these stone crosses represent an important stage in that gruesome journey. Centres of pilgrimage sprang up throughout Europe, attracting large crowds sometimes from great distances, and many became as notorious as they were pious. Chaucer's Canterbury Tales show that the topics of conversation were not limited to contemplating the lives of the saints. Even at Glendalough, many of the pastimes seem to have had little in common with saintly pursuits, and with the passage of time, whatever control the church authorities had had on it in former times, its grip loosened, and the event became ever more secular and more rowdy. This painting depicts an innocent enough affair. The large crowd is well behaved, and while there is no real evidence of a religious content, neither is there anything threatening or dangerous. In 1813, Joseph Peacock depicted it differently. He recorded faction fights and the molesting of unprotected women. From the late 18th to the middle of the 19th centuries, Glendalough was a magnet for artists, and the pattern was a recurring theme of their work. By the middle of the century, many ancient patterns were discontinued on the orders of the bishops, and the pattern of Glendalough fell victim to Episcopal displeasure in 1862. But the people of the area still held to the oral tradition, embellished by each generation of tellers. A young mother died, probably in childbirth, leaving a distraught father to raise a suckling baby. In desperation, the young man brought the child to St. Kevin. Kevin used his influence with the animal kingdom to persuade a lactating deer to shed her milk into this depression in what has become known as the deer stone. The obliging hind continued to do this until the child was able to take solids. Kevin supervised this unusual milk delivery and the marks of his fingers and palm can still be felt in the stone. Then there is the cross. Archaeological and ecclesiastical authorities are quite content to savour its historical and religious importance. Cut from a single piece of granite, it represents the transitionary style between the incised cross of very early Christian times to the extremely elaborate high crosses of the 10th and 11th centuries such as this one at Clonmacnoiz. But in the paranormal world of legend, this cross can grant a wish to those who can encircle it with their arms. If the circle is completed by touching fingertips, the wish is granted, but only if it is for the benefit of someone else although others maintain that the lovelorn who performed the task will marry within a year and a day. In the sheer rock face of the southern shore of the upper lake is a small square of shadow. It is a hollow cut into the rock, and legend claims that it was here that the society shunning St. Kevin slept. This is St. Kevin's bed. The recess has been modified, if not created by human hand, but it is impossible to say when the work was carried out. Until the 1960s, pilgrims could take a boat across the lake, climb up to the bed, and crawl in. It was extremely dangerous. Today's more cautious visitors are content to look at it from the safety of the North Shore. The most intriguing Glendalough legend of all concerns this place and tells a story of unrequited love, inflamed passions, and murder. Kevin, 
the beautifully born one, attracted the attention of a female. Her name was Kathleen. Thinking she could cure him of his saintly ways, she chased him to his bed and revealed all her charms to him. He too revealed all, but only to roll in nettles to counteract any amorous ambitions she might have aroused. Satisfied that he was not going to weaken, he proceeded to beat her with the nettles until she repented her former ways, or so the ending goes. The better known version tells how she approached him in his secluded cell while he slept. He awoke with a start, and grabbing her, he gave the poor creature a shake. I wish that the polis had caught him. He threw her right into the lake, and she sank straight away to the bottom. There has been mining of one sort or another in County Wicklow for centuries. Copper, sulphur, zinc and tin have been extracted and exported. Silver and gold are also to be found. In the westernmost reaches of Glendalough, the meandering Glenallow River winds through bleak marshlands that contrast starkly with the lushness of the lower valley. It was at this secluded spot and nearby Glendasson that Wicklow lead mining was most active. Between 1807 and 1812, ten separate lead mining operations were begun in the county. This one was the most remote and soon became known as Van Diemen's. Like the isolated colony of Tasmania, it was the last place on earth anyone would wish to be. Shafts were dug far into the mountain, sometimes up to almost a mile, and the waste was simply piled nearby. A hundred people worked here. Men and women did this backbreaking toil. Children were also in great demand. They could squeeze into small spaces. Here, the rocks were offloaded. Workers too infirm through age or accident would then break the rocks into smaller pieces and extract the lead ore by hand. This building, by the water's edge, housed a water wheel which powered a mechanical hammer used to crush the ore to a fine grain. It was then carted away to the port of Wicklow for export. This place is desolate now, but for the greater part of the 19th century it reverberated to the sights and sounds of a busy workplace. The miners were more than a workforce. They were a community, their bonds forged by hardship and isolation. Their houses, built from the granite scree which extremes of weather had broken from the rock faces high above, portray solidity but little comfort. The most striking feature of this part of Glendalough is the dearth of plant life. Trees were cut down for pit crops, and mining spoils are too toxic to allow vegetation. Operations ceased in 1880, but were recommenced in 1919 for a short period. Little remains to tell the world of these people's existence. The growth in popularity in hillwalking has seen an increase in the number of pedestrian visitors to the valley. Probably more people come here on foot than at any time since the days of the annual patterns and pilgrimages. Glendalough lies exactly halfway on the long distance walking route known as the Wicklow Way. Stretching 132 kilometres from Marley Park on the southern outskirts of the city of Dublin to Clonagall in County Carlow, the Wicklow Way crosses the Wicklow Mountains and many of the county's finest glens and magnificent scenery, following ancient pathways and woodland tracks. The brainchild of inveterate long-distance hill walker, the late J.B. Malone. The way was first planned in the early 1960s. Malone's walk was voluntary, driven by his desire to share his knowledge and his love of the mountains. In 1966, he published the first version of what was to become the Wicklow Way, 
a circuitous route that would take the walker south into the mountains and returning to Dublin by West Wicklow. By the late 70s, Cusbor, the National Sports Council, realised the potential of the scheme and employed Malone to implement his ideas. There was one major change, however. The Wicklow Way's circuitous route became a linear one, ending at Clonigal. The section of the way which passes through Glendalough skirts the High Ridge, dropping down here to emerge at the gate of the monastic city. At this crossroads, a few hundred metres on from the waterfall, the Wicklow Way branches off to the left and into the neighbouring valley of Glenmalure. A short but more spectacular walk can be taken by turning right. This leads to the steep stairway that goes to the top of the Spink, the cliff that rises sheer from the water's edge of the upper lake. The sleepers continue, offering safety for every footfall. It is possible to complete the circuit around the upper lake. Back at Lara village, the Glendalough Woollen Mills and Craft Shop mark the start of one of the most pleasant and less strenuous walks in the valley. This woodland path leads walkers towards the monastic city, about a mile from this starting point. The road continues on, skirting the south shore of the lower lake, leading the walker to the information centre and the upper lake. Notwithstanding its mining past and its tourism present, Glendalough is essentially a place of spirituality. It has a closeness with nature and a tranquility. It has been known as a centre of learning, study and spiritual healing. It has always been and remains a place apart.